The last uh, part of our program is a, a panel uh, talking about Steve's contributions uh, to practice of finance. And I'm going to let uh, Eric introduce the panelists. But uh, before we do that, I just wanted to share a small story. Uh, one conversation we had with Steve uh, over lunch. And uh, at that time, uh, he started talking about some new developments in molecular biology that he found really fascinating. And uh, of course, he started his academic life as a physicist. He studied uh, at Caltech. He really loved physics, and uh, he took lectures from Feynman. But he was saying that biology is really going to be the new queen of disciplines, uh, the way uh, physics used to be in the 20th century, 21st century is going to be biology. And then uh, I remember asking him, so if you think this is so exciting, Steve, if you were going to grad school right now, are you saying you would actually go to do life sciences? He says, actually, right now, I wouldn't even go to grad school. I would go straight into business. <laughs> because uh, it's actually fascinating. It's uh, so complex. You get all these problems, the ill-defined problems, so much room for creativity. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Eric. OK, so we have a great panel today to <laughs> talk about Steve's influences on the practice of finance. And we're going to make a short presentation each. but. Then I want to open it up to, uh, to questions. So first up, we're going to have a short video from Rami Goldstein. Rami was one of Steve's first PhD students at Yale, graduating in 1978. Rami was an early mover in high-frequency trading and data-driven algorithmic models. He spent many years at UBS's equity derivatives group before founding his own highly successful hedge fund, IVC, after a slight hiccup in 1998. We all have that on our resume. <laughs> uh, Steve was a board member of IVC for the 15-year life of the firm. Next up is uh, Peter Carr. Peter received his PhD in finance from UCLA in 1989 and taught at Cornell for eight years. He was head of quantitative financial research at Bloomberg, and in 2010 moved to Morgan Stanley in their market modeling group. He is now the chair of the finance and risk engineering department at NYU's Tandon School, but that doesn't compete with the MFINs here. <laughs> Finally, we'll hear from Greg Hawkins. Greg and I date back to 1972, oh. when we were living together in MIT fraternity on Beacon Street. Greg received his PhD also here at Sloan in 1982, taught at Berkeley, then went to Solomon Brothers, LTCM, and was recently at City as Chief Risk Officer in their Markets and Real Estate Group. So it was over 40 years ago when I started in the PhD program uh, here at MIT in finance uh, with the Black-Scholes paradigm just coming out a few years er earlier, it was great to be uh, a PhD student here. And I see many uh, fellow students uh, in the audience. We were immersed in stochastic calculus and Bob Merton's continuous time framework. But Steve's work also had a great influence on us. His seminal work in 1973 on APT was like a Bible for me and has shaped the way I think about risk-return relationships to this day. His equally seminal work on risk-neutral pricing and the binomial options model uh, became our default framework for valuing complex securities at Solomon Brothers. And of course, his term structure model work was the foundation for all of our models at Solomon and LTCM. But one paper that really intrigued me was his recovery theorem paper. As an options trader, and I traded options uh, for over 30 years, we look at historical volatility of the underlying asset, as well as the implied vols of similar options. But the implied vols we used were always some sort of Black-Scholes log normal framework. A major concern that we had was, were we using the wrong distribution? As Merton and also Cox-Ross have shown, um, 
Imagine a short dated out of the money option. If you evaluate it with a log normal process, at almost any level of volatility, you get a zero option price. Why? Because there's no chance that it can diffuse in the money, into the money, in such a short period of time. That probability is essentially zero. But if you change the distribution to, say, a jump process with the same variance as the diffusion process, you get a very different answer. The option has value because even in a short period of time, you could jump in the money. Even just before expiration, the option has value because it could jump in the money. I did learn this, unfortunately, the hard way at Solomon in 1985 when I was the fixed income options trader. Of course, I was the head fixed income options trader, but I was also the only fixed income options trader. <laughs> A month earlier, I had participated in the first trade on the Chicago Board of Trade T-Note options. They had just listed this new security, which was options on a 10-year note future. I participated in the very first transaction uh, of that new contract. I sold one month out of the money calls on the 10-year note future. It was a Friday, it was now 30 days later, the options were maturing. It was a Friday in the early summer. Nothing was happening. At 3 p.m. when the futures stopped trading, the options were still a half a point out of the money. Really no chance of diffusing into the money in the next two hours. Earlier I had passed on paying a de minimis price to buy back the options I had. Uh, sold because I felt even a de minimis price was too much uh, according to the Black-Scholes formula. Well, at 4.30 I had my feet up reading the paper, what are you doing this weekend, and unexpectedly, out of the blue, the Fed cut the discount rate 50 basis points. Ten-year bonds were up immediately two points, but futures hadn't moved and I had sold an option on the 10-year note future. Futures hadn't moved because the exchange was closed. So, but the holders of the option had until 5 p.m. to decide whether they would exercise their options or not. Hey, it was a nice day in the summer, maybe people had gone home early, and they wouldn't exercise their options. Of course, everyone exercised their options. When the dust cleared, uh, I was out about a point and a half. Uh, it was a very difficult conversation I had with my boss as I pulled him off the golf course to explain. But I digress. The beauty of Steve's paper is that it's very difficult to identify the distribution of the underlying asset from its historical prices. Whether it is log normal, or fat tails or jumps, it all gets blurred in the data. You just can't identify easily which distribution it is. But Steve proposed a new lens, not just looking at historical data, but look at the underlying distribution implicit in the contingent claims prices on that underlying asset. If only he had written the article 30 years earlier. The, most, the paper that was the most contentious between Steve and myself was a little known one he'd written 20 years ago for Risk Magazine entitled Forensic Finance. I love this paper. Yeah. In it, Steve talks about not being a financial engineer, but a financial coroner being retained as an advisor to sort out a mess after some sort of financial disaster. Some of these included the Hunt Brothers, Silver Squeeze of the early 80s, the SNL crisis, and Enron. In this paper, he discusses the near bankruptcy of MG, Mattel Gesellschaft, a German trading company. MG had sold oil contracts with delivery commitments out 10 years. 
they hedged this obligation by buying futures on oil. This was really a pure arbitrage at maturity. They were long oil futures and short an obligation to deliver uh, oil in the future. The problem was holding this arbitrage until maturity. When oil fell, they lost money on the futures contract, but had a mark-to-market profit on the contract they had sold. The problem was they didn't receive the funds from the uh, value of the contract that they had sold until maturity. So they were out cash on the futures contracts they were long, but they didn't receive symmetrically the cash on the contracts that they had sold. The arbitrage only worked at maturity, not along the intervening path. Steve went on to compare the MG disaster to that of LTCM, a little closer to home for me. Even though I would say, you know, uh, it really wasn't me, it, it was the other guys. <laughs> he looked at our convergence trade of being long an illiquid cheap off the run 20-year bond against being short and on the run 30-year uh, bond. And, um, but, uh, the f but on the other side, we had the financings of both of those positions. The bond that we were long, we had termed out repo uh, to the maturity of the trade, and the bond we were short we had financed with a reverse repo also to the term of the trade. And unlike MG, the, um, the, uh, the mark to mark, it was totally symmetric. Uh, we never had to come out of cash to hold our trade unless the spreads widened. So I argue that this symmetric cash flow was very different than MG, and I pointed to the last day of LTCM. It happened to be Wednesday, September 23rd, 1998. We had a $125 billion balance sheet supported by $400 million of equity. Yes, a slight 312 to 1 leverage, but we didn't go under because we had to unwind our arbitrage trades. We went under because we ran out of NAV. But Steve pointed out to me that all of our strategies were built around models. As financial engineers, we use models not to blindly follow them, but to garner intuition about the financial strategy at hand. We understand the limitations of the models and in what region their predictions are suspect. Think of this out of the money short dated options. These models are beneficial, but they're not 100% perfect. Leverage, while not bad in its own right, accentuates the region where the models can fall apart. Perhaps if the partners had been a little more humble about the limitations of our model, the results would have been a little different. I never took a class from Steve. I was never a colleague of Steve. But for me, he was most generous with his time, his ideas, and his spirit, and I will miss him very much. OK, unfortunately, Rami was unable to make it, but he sent us a, a short video. Good afternoon, I'm Rami Goldstein. I'm sorry I'm unable to be with you uh, because I'm recovering from an operation and I'm unable to fly. I was one of Steve's first uh, PhD students at Yale back in 1997, some 40 years ago. And when Leonid asked me to say a few words, I reached out to my contemporary Phil Dibvig and asked Phil what he thought this audience might want to hear about Steve. And Phil wrote back one word, everything. 
Well, I feel I'm going to fall short somewhat in delivery here, but let me see if I can say a few things that are of interest. Um, Steve was my teacher, was my mentor, like many, too many in this room, but I also had the fortune of having Steve as a business partner and a director in companies I set up uh, since, the early since the late uh, 90s. And I got to observe Steve in situations that some of you perhaps, or most of you perhaps, have not had a chance to. So perhaps I can share some vignettes uh, from that experience. Uh, Steve, the brilliant academician, the inspiring teacher, um, the consultant and board member to many illustrious organizations, needs no further description here. But in addition to all the above, um, Steve pursued over the years a productive business career that combined his amazing analytical skills and amazing people skills and a Rolodex that felt infinite, spanned many dimensions in business, in academe, in government, and also felt infinite in its geographical span. Uh, and uh, Steve was a major asset to all the business teams that he interacted with. Um, if I ask myself what were the two things that strike you the most uh, in, this activity, in, in Steve's business activity, it was his clarity of thought and his enthusiasm. Steve had this gift of walking into a situation and ferreting out very quickly, often in real time, what the core issue was, whether it was analytical, whether it was institutional, and coming out with a practical way of dealing with it and making people feel that his solution was their own. And he did this with tremendous enthusiasm. Steve had this feature that I also experienced as a student. He could explain a complicated thing very simply and make you feel that you understood the full depth of his, of his explanation. And then when you'd walk away, you'd find out that you can't explain it to yourself. But he did so with amazing enthusiasm. And Steve was enthusiastic about everything he did and about everything he, he, he talked about. Uh, he was enthusiastic about Carol, about their family, about the... Um, Indian pipe collection, about his wine collection, uh, about the, the Boxster sadly totaled a few years back, about the New York Times crossword puzzle, and all sorts of other things he would talk about when, he come, when he'd come into the office. And his enthusiasm was completely infectious, and people liked working with him for that reason. Um, and his ideas, his analytical ideas, sometimes worked spectacularly well in the business context, and at other times, less so. So, for example, in 1997, uh, Steve was on the board of Gen Re. He was chairman of the risk committee, as I recall. I was running a, a global derivatives operation for UBS. And Steve and I compared notes frequently. Steve was also always very interested in how analytical-based activities pan out in an institutional environment. And we both understood our respective organizations pretty well. And... Uh, we realized quickly that running the risks of a reinsurance company and running the risks of a major derivatives book were very complementary. Steve ran, ran some numbers, uh, and he came and said, uh, you know, we should get these organizations to merge. And I said, Steve, that's not what quants do. And he was relentless, and he wouldn't let go until we got both senior managements in the same room at the same time for the better part of a day to thrash out this idea. Well, it turns out that this idea had a lot of merits, but the bank side felt that merging a reinsurance company and an investment bank was a step too far for them to take. A few months later, Warren Buffett, um, whose Berkshire Hathaway group had a significant derivatives operation, reached out and bought Genry and folded it into the Berkshire Hathaway group. Now, Steve was not involved with that transaction, having been a board member of the um, target company. But after the announcement... Steve called me and said, well, it wasn't a stupid idea after all. And of, and of course, he was right. Steve's idea and contribution in business were not confined to matters of high strategy. He was very down-to-earth and very practical in all matters. So, for example, in 2000, uh, shortly after we set up our main company, we found ourselves competing with major investment banks in Europe uh, for a structured note transaction uh, for an insurance company. And the final beauty contest was on a Friday afternoon. And the board to whom we were presenting requested many changes that were not part of the original specification. And uh, most of the teams presenting felt that they needed the better part of a week 
to rejig the structure and come up with a new pricing. Uh, Steve said, uh, we will be ready to present our new price to fold the new structure on uh, Monday morning at 9 a.m. And I said, really, Steve? How is that? We had no analyst on our presentation team. It was late Friday afternoon. People in the London office were already dispersing for the weekend. And Steve said, no, I can do this. And I thought he meant he could do the analytics, which I'm sure he could. But no, that's not all he meant. He meant he would do the analytics, he would write down the equations, he would do the programming, he would do the testing, and we would make sure that we had the price and we, could, we would be ready to present on um, Monday morning. Well, it turns out Steve's laptop had a Fortran compiler on it and the quasi-modern development environment. And the last time I had seen Fortran was in 1978 at the Yale Computer Center, long since gone. And I assumed that Fortran was also gone. And for all I know, it was. And perhaps Steve was the only Fortran user in the world. <laughs> As we're walking out of the boardroom, Steve turns to me and he says, if I get this done by Saturday night, you'll pay for the wine. And I'm thinking, okay, Steve is jet lagged. I know exactly what needs to be done, which is quite a lot. Uh, he's not an early riser on his foreign trips anyway, so that's a decent bet. So I say, done. Fast forward, 24 hours later, I find myself paying for a very expensive bottle of 1982 Chateau La Tour Pouillac, which goes to demonstrate yet again that doing the rational ana analysis doesn't always lead you to place the right bet. In any event, come Monday morning, we are ready to uh, present, we present, and we win the mandate. Now, this was just wonderful episode to watch. Steve talking to a non-technical board about a technical matter, uh, understanding their requirements which were poorly specified, figuring out the analytics that go with it, writing down the equations, doing the programming, doing the testing, doing the presentation, and getting them to accept the solution in terms that they felt comfortable with. It's not a big story in a cosmic scale, right? But um, it doesn't get much better than that. In, in, as far as these things go. And uh, sometimes a small story can tell a lot. And I believe this one does. I miss working with Steve. I miss him. Next up, Peter. Okay, um, so I... Um I'd like to uh, go through just this one slide and also share a few personal experiences I had with Steve. So um, I just wanted to, we were supposed to talk about his contributions to industry. So my background is I spent 20 years in the financial industry, mostly at Morgan Stanley, but also at Bloomberg and Bank of America. And um, I, I, uh, the first paper I actually ever understood uh, when I was at UCLA as a doctoral student was actually one of Steve Ross's. And um, it was uh, his signaling paper uh, where he was using debt. And uh, extremely well-written paper. I think that, I mean, one of the things I noted is, is his writing skills were just amazing to me. I mean, just, uh, he was a man of letters <laughs> as well as math. And uh, so it's something you can easily see in all of his papers. So, um, as has been mentioned today, he's founded several pillars of modern finance, such as agency theory, mutual fund separation, and arbitrage pricing theory. And of those three, the first two, I feel, explain why things are. And APT does that, but it also can answer many how questions, such as how to form a portfolio or how to price an option. So when I think of the APT, I don't specifically think of what Andy Lowe presented, for example. To me, that's just a special case of the more general arbitrage pricing theory that Steve essentially contributed so greatly to. And um, so these how questions are extremely important to practitioners, okay? I mean, I think um, we like to understand why things are the way they are, but at the end of the day, the, you typically have a fairly short horizon. You need to do certain things, and so just knowing how to do those things is incredibly important. And so, as Eric was saying, um, these answers Steve gave us were incredibly useful for, um, for, for thinking about problems. And um, so, if we interpret APT broadly, 
um, as essentially how far can you go when you just require the absence of arbitrage and don't necessarily require equilibrium. Um, it's you know, quite surprising how far you can go. And um, so I'll go through the various topics at the bottom of my slide. Um, so factor models, um, as uh, Andy presented, um, is essentially, I think of it as kind of a way to convert the, the local linearity you get in derivatives pricing to essentially global linearity across assets. Okay, so you know there's less factors than there are assets, and um, on the derivatives side, the usual approach, let's say, is that the derivative is redundant. So there's less, um, there's again more assets than sources of uncertainty. Um, on the Cox-Ross risk-neutral valuation. Um, that paper was very important in my thinking, personally. Um, and um, essentially, uh, I remember hearing Dick Roll explain it in our doctoral seminar at UCLA as the paper that essentially showed that the ideas in Black, Scholes, and Merton were far from confined to that log normal setting they worked in. And um, so I'd say it was um, definitely the paper that later led the, um, the founders of the sort of general theory of arbitrage pricing, which includes Ross alone in his JET paper, let's say, to develop their more general theory. So I'm also thinking of Harrison Krebs, Harrison Pliska, and so on, and they, they credit that, that paper as, as is deserved. And um, the, um, I guess the, the interesting point is, I mean, this term risk-neutral valuation is just so commonly used in industry. I mean, it's just like, I mean, it was such a revolution in some ways. Um, you know, I spent 20 years thinking about risk-neutral probabilities. I almost forgot what real-world probabilities are about. <laughs> you know, it was like they were sort of irrelevant in some ways for the simple pricing tasks we were basically asked to do and hedging tasks as well. So, so um, I have to tell you that even when it comes to measuring risks, like things like value at risk, the reality on Wall Street, like it or not, is that people use risk-neutral probabilities to calculate value at risk, okay? And uh, so this gives you an idea of how pervasive it is. So the, um, the fundamental theorems of asset pricing is a term that comes from Phil Divig and um, I think is actually quite appropriate. So um, there's essentially three parts to it. So um, first part is um, absence of arbitrage implies existence of equivalent martingale measures, uh, plural. Um, their plurality is because there's actually several possible numeraires. We usually in, often pick one, but there's several. And um, as well, when markets are incomplete, even after you pick a numeraire, there's, there's often an infinite number of associated <laughs> martingale measures for that numeraire. So, so these are results that we know now, but let's say we're far from obvious in the 70s when you're seeing black shoals and so on. So, so um, the Cox-Ross-Rubinstein binomial model is sort of the prototypical, simple uh, model of a complete market. And um, let's say um, people use it in industry because they have to come up with unique answers for prices and hedges, okay? Um, it's, um, you know, so we kind of fully understand that the world is much more complicated than, say, a binomial model would indicate. Um, nonetheless, you can't go to your boss and say, well, the price is somewhere between $10 and $20. <laughs> they actually want a unique number. So um, let's say uh, when uh, we were hearing earlier about that model, I mean, it was said that there's a lot of economic intuition, and that may be so for economists, but I have to tell you that um, that model is used by people who know nothing of <laughs> economics, okay? And um, um, it's just, you know, it's just, simplifies things dramatically, as is in the title of their paper. So it's um, essentially a fantastic pedagogical tool, a pretty good numerical tool, and um, it's just, um, I think, guides a lot of our intuition, even in settings that are not formally discrete time or discrete space. So, <clears throat> so then that brings me to the cox ingersoll ross interest rate model. So I think there, um, as was mentioned, it was the first popular 
model that kept interest rates non-negative. Nowadays, we actually have negative interest rates in some countries, so it's, <laughs> let's say, needs some adjustment. I mean, the simple practical solution that everybody does is merely to just shift a model like that down to what is now felt to be the lowest possible rate, let's say negative 1%. And so it's still useful even if, you know, as a starting point just by shifting down. So it shouldn't be dismissed um, just because rates are negative. And, um, you know, I have to tell you that the, the particular process, that mean reverting square root process, was, you know, just because it was non-negative, was so useful for lots of other things. So Heston used it to describe variances, which are obviously not negative. Uh, people use it to describe hazard rates, which are obviously not negative. So, so it just goes way beyond the particular application to interest rates that they, that they did. OK, and that brings me finally to this Ross recovery theorem that Eric already talked about. So um, I, um, I um, saw Ross's working paper very early on. I mean, it got, it came out around 2010, and um, uh, he didn't publish it in Journal of Finance until 2015. And um, you know, the um, I think he, he submitted it fairly quickly. Um, so it was quite a battle. Um, I actually spoke with Cam Harvey about it a few times. And um, anyway, I mean, it's um, it's it's a fairly stylized model uh, as presented. Uh, so he has um, a finite state Markov chain and um, time homogeneous dynamics and a single state variable. These are all, you know, to me, fairly stylized. Um, I have to tell you, in industry, nobody works with time homogeneous processes. So when I mentioned that to Steve, he said, well, you know, just take away all the calendar effects and what are you left with? <laughs> you know, so it's just kind of a quick way of <laughs> dealing with uh, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so then I remember um, he had this finite state space, and he was thinking that he would get real world probabilities from S&P 500 options. And I, you know, so you, you naturally ask, well, if there's this finite number of states for S&P 500, what happens when you reach the highest possible value? Okay? You know, and so he said, well, then they'll pay dividends and come down. And uh, so what, what, when you reach the low, he said, well, the interest rate's positive, they'll come up. <laughs> so we always had an answer. You could never, you know, you could never, you thought you, you had him beat on something. He always had an answer. That's uh, kind of the way he was. So, so anyway, um, I actually wrote a paper that was like totally based on his working paper and ended up publishing it two years before he did, so it was kind of frustrating. And um, the, um, you know, my paper just showed this, that some of what he was talking about could sort of extend to uh, actually an uncountably infinite number of states, because I was working with a diffusion. Um, but it had to have a bounded domain. And um, so anyway, um, it doesn't, it's well known that it doesn't hold in more general settings. And so let's say um, one could take the view that, therefore, um, it's not going to be very useful. Um, I actually wrote two different papers that had nothing to do with recovering real world probabilities that used the exact same math. Okay? So, uh, so that's kind of the cool thing, that um, whenever you need uniqueness of something positive, you can use these ideas. Okay? And so, um, so I was asked at Morgan Stanley to think about pricing an option on private equity. And um, let's say the difficulty is that you don't know the price of the underlying because it's private equity. <laughs> okay, So well, I had been working on this Ross recovery thing, so I just essentially said, well, uh, just use the same math. But now think of the so-called numerator portfolio that I had used in my Ross paper as, in fact, the underlying for this option. And then it gets uniquely determined. It's positive. It all works. So anyway, so that's the beauty of his, his general, I think, way of he, that he thought about problems is he, he, he had particular financial applications in mind and told you what they were. But the essential modeling was done generally enough that even if it failed in the particular application, you could easily, I would say, uh, apply it elsewhere. So, so that. Uh, it was kind of a hallmark of his research, I would say, and um, probably why uh, we're here today. So um, let me uh, now turn the floor over to, to Greg. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd just like to emphasize one thing. The use of the binomial model 
across all areas of financial endeavors is it's pervasive. We use it to basically fit term structures, as Mark mentioned, and, and value things. I had to listen, listen to you today, though, I actually have a question. John, why did you guys specify a square root process instead of a binomial process that hit, hit the parameters you wanted? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, the first kind is always the hardest. That's why you were making the big bucks. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't here to talk about this question. I wanted to bring up a topic that hasn't been talked about much today, and that was Steve's interest in real estate. I don't know when it started, but it was clear he was very interested throughout his career in, in real estate. As far as I can tell, the written interest started when he was at Goldman Sachs starting in 80. 1987. He, uh, he followed Dick Roll, who had been there before, and I think they were both brought in by Fisher Black, who was a partner at Goldman Sachs at that time. What was interesting is Dick Roll focused on the structuring side of the equation. He worked on CMOs. He actually got Goldman to issue the first IOPO deal. Now, it was, it was a flawed structure but it got the market started. And Doug probably bought it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it had an equity piece attached to it that, on the I.O. that didn't, didn't really work, I don't think. Steve took a completely different approach. They were both working in real estate and mortgages. He decided uh, to look at real estate as an asset class. He wrote three papers while I was at Goldman, uh, with others as usual. I mean. God knows he wrote, he was generous with his time and with his authorships. Uh, and he looked at diversification in the real estate market, both the geographical and property type, and how you could form efficient frontiers with those. And then he took it a step further, obviously. He was worried about the so-called market portfolio and added real estate to stock and bonds. And it was, it was kind of difficult because we don't, in real estate, you don't have continuous auction-type markets like you do in the others. So doing some of the estimates of risk and return are, are tricky. Uh, Goldman Sachs, I called them on Monday and said, can you find these papers for me? Because I know you've got them stored somewhere. They couldn't find them. But I don't think it matters. I was, I was actually interested in seeing them. Uh, it doesn't actually matter because he did a, a paper in the journal of portfolio management that I think probably included all the, all the information was in the Goldman papers. 
And he talks about these diversification effects and how use real estate as an efficient portfolio. The only other real paper he, he published on real estate, uh, he obviously didn't feel like he had good means and, and, and standard deviations for the real estate uh, asset. So he wrote a paper for the Journal of uh, Real Estate and Economics where he used some very nice techniques, very sophisticated obviously, to try to estimate means and, uh, and risk in real estate portfolios. And I'm guessing that paper is probably looked at by a lot of real estate professionals today. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Eric and I were Solomon Brothers at the time, and instead of working on uh, portfolio inclusion, we were working on valuation. Obviously, stuff that Steve done all the work on. Yeah. We were more interested in actually, though, substituting mortgages and real estate for other assets like fixed income or equities. Uh, more of a relative value approach than the one that, that he had taken at Goldman. Uh, but once again, Steve was working on the broader issue that a lot of us didn't feel like we could, could tame. Uh, I think Steve was not only interested in real estate as an investment class, but as an investment. <laughs> uh, he joined, I remember he joined a group back in the late 80s trying to buy a thrift. That, that didn't work out. But they also tried to buy RTC assets. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly how successful that was or exactly what happened to it. Uh, he was also a member of the Freddie Mac board up until 2008, as far as I can tell. Uh, so he definitely had an interest in real estate in a, in a lot of different uh, frameworks. I knew Steve, obviously, but I didn't get to know him well until October of 2007, when I was on a panel dis uh, discussion on real estate uh, valuations here for the MIT Econ Department. After the seminar, I had dinner with Steve, Paul Samuelson, Jim, and one other person who I couldn't remember who it was. But it was a very interesting conversation because everybody was focused on CBOs back then. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the seminar was pretty much about levels of real estate, but I think the CBO market was, had captured everybody's attention. It was, it was a strange market in a lot of ways I won't go into. Uh, and I just threw out the proposition that maybe the CBO market violated Miller and Bedigliani. And if so, why did we think that was? Steve jumped on that immediately. Uh, to protect Miller and Bedigliani with frictions included. And we actually had a very, very lively discussion that night. Uh, after dinner, Steve and I went off to have a glass of wine which I, I guess he's done with a lot of people in this room, mm -hmm. uh, and talk more about particular real estate investments. I mean, he, he obviously had spent a lot of time thinking about and maybe investing in specific products. And I'm not sure how he fit that into his investment portfolio view, but he was clearly interested in derivatives off of real estate and underlying real estate itself. Uh, I remember one other notable dinner. Steve came to, uh, for an MIT econ breakfast. We held it at the Citigroup uh, boardroom. And he was going to talk about recovery theory. Uh, the night before, he, he and I and a guy named Roy Hendrickson, who was also a PhD student here, uh, had dinner together at where else? Le Cirque, because I, I was paying. <laughs> uh, ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, what was interesting is Roy was wanting to talk about factor premia and portfolio arrangement and, and the, the standard stuff people like to ask Steve about. All Steve wanted to talk about was real estate. It was, uh, it, it was eye opening. I mean, he, he, I don't know, maybe it was just with me, but we had several conversations on the phone about what was going on in the real estate market, where the good investments might be. So it's, it's some, it's a, phase of his character that we don't often talk, talk about in academia, 
but it was clearly something that was on his mind a lot. Anyway, that's, uh, I just wanted to throw real estate into the mix of the things he'd, he'd also done some work on. Well, let's, uh, let's open it up to questions. All questions are fair game. Yeah, Doug. I was a young PhD student at Stanford working with Bob Litzenberger and trying to price state contingent claims out of options. Steve's paper just turned alive on me for uh, me. And also, Cox was on my dissertation committee. We read Cox, Ingersoll, Ross. Sandy Grossman brought in things. I think he brought in the, the options and efficiency, but the spanning arguments in there are just beautiful. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's one of the most brilliant papers I've ever read. We couldn't have done our work without it. Mark, let me ask you a question. Did you regret your time on Wall Street before you went back to UCLA? Yeah, I loved every minute of it, especially time with you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it sounds like you followed Steve's advice for an assistant professor to spend time in the financial industry. You were one of the few who did, right? I passed it on to Francis Walsh after. Okay, okay, yes, that's right. Uh huh. It all goes back to Steve. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm not a, uh, I was an undergraduate student at Steve's at Penn, uh, and I wrote a, we stayed friends over the years, and I, I wrote a paper with him on called The True Cost of Social Security, where we uh, used arbitrage pricing theory to value Social Security and found that the Social Security trustees were undervaluing it by the, uh, the liability by about 20%. So uh, that's an unpublished paper, but it's on my website. It's probably a lower bound now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Steve, you guys have, uh, well, you, you, know, you all, you know, experience the same as Steve. <clears throat> Steve's guy in the world, and he's the smartest guy in the world. Any other comments or questions? I have a question, actually. So um, I would get calls like about every six months from Steve, <laughs> just randomly. Uh, did anyone else uh, experience that? You did too? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, two yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you spend 10 minutes and they'd be gone. You know, and it was like, yeah. So, and yeah. So the, he has that 203 area code, so it was the only one I knew. So I mean, I'd pick up the phone and say, hi, Steve, how you doing? <laughs> you know, it was like, just. I don't know. It was, a, it was. I don't actually know anybody else who would do that. And uh, anyway, it was just kind of fun. John, we're getting lunch today. Didn't matter what I was doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure he did that with lots of other people too. <laughs> yeah, like I said. He'd invite you to dinner if you were paying. Steve always paid pretty much when I was going over there. <laughs> <laughs> you'd go to a restaurant with Steve, and walk in, Steve would say, do you have any lobsters? And the guy would say, yeah, we have some, we well, only have one and a half pound lobsters. He says, he says, we want four of them. There was only two of us there. <laughs> you had lobster with Steve. I mean, <laughs> I like lobster, fortunately. Yeah, one of the one of the first dinners. I think maybe the first dinner I had with you at Yale uh, is also when Paul Milgram had come to Yale. There are five of us at dinner. There's a, there was a speaker. Oh, and <laughs> you were there at that one? I don't no, know. They, I don't know. I was at this. this I this was one. there at this dinner where where uh, they had, well we have very few lobsters right now and uh, anything we sell is triple the price. Steve said, okay, we'll take them off. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, this one was a little, almost the same. This one was, uh, there are five of us. It's the speaker, and, and John was there, and Paul Milton, and, and me Steve. and Steve. Yeah. And, and I think that was the first one, because I think Steve didn't know that you didn't drink, and he didn't know that the speaker didn't drink. And, so he couldn't drink that much. And, uh, and so 
And so he says, how many, how many lobsters do you have? And they go back in the back, and they come out and say, we have, we have 10, they're just showing off, we have, we have 10 pound and three quarter lobsters. And Steve says, we'll take them. <laughs> and we had this big, massive dinner. And it's probably much to Carol's chagrin if she ever knew about it. <laughs> One each broiled and one each stuffed and stuffed. Yeah, one was one was one one was yeah one was uh, steamed or boiled and the other one was steamed, was steamed and stuffed and broiled. I think they were, we, we each had one each. Yeah, <laughs> and then the other one was 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 stuffed with seafood. They had a bunch yeah. of seafood on with with, with the stuff. And then there was a pasta course and a salad course and a dessert course. <laughs> Yeah. Of course, that could have been a different dinner, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least I, this could be substitutable. And, and, and tons of wine. And, uh, and I guess, I guess uh, uh, Paul Milgram's wife found them downstairs playing ping pong at midnight or something. <laughs> and singing. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there are a lot of stories about Steve, but I think if you like this one, they're probably better for our drink. Where are we headed, Leonid? Well, we are having, heading for drinks and uh, dinner uh, next door. So please join me in thanking all the presenters for a wonderful day of discussions. Uh, the dinner is going to be next door. We'll show the way. It's um, in E52, uh, if you know what that means. Many of us do. So it's um, right in the next building. Thank you. Thank you.